Number 10, Baby Lois and Super Baby. Being transformed into a baby can be fun, I guess, at least in comic books. In issue 147 of Batman, Bruce Wayne becomes a baby for a bit, and Robin, well, Robin did not become a baby. That was the fun part. We have a baby and a not baby. Great. Now the businessman on the cover of the comic says, look out, it's Bat Baby and Robin. Like he's already okay with the fact that Batman is a baby. So this is normal in comic books. People turn into babies and it's fine. So Bat Baby has the same strength as Batman. So it's funny. Now sometimes baby comic book action can get weird. In Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane issue 59, we see more baby verse. I mean, just the front page, what's going on here? Superman's getting spanked. He's having a great time getting spanked. Also, why is he an infant? I have so many questions. Well, in this comic, Super Baby is from an alternate reality and Superman is still around. He's just not around right now because it's fun. So Lois ends up bringing home this baby alternate Superman and it's fun and it's wacky and weird. I mean, it's kind of fun. Super Baby rips apart photos of Lois Lane and Superman. So Lois spanks him a lot and she's like rolling her wrist out in between the spanks. It's, you know, casual day in the 60s, I guess. Things get even more weird when after the baby is returned back to his home world, he marries both Lois and Lana. What a weird day for the crew all around. Number nine, Harley Quinn and Harley Quinn. Do you think if you met another version of yourself, you'd get along with them? Better question, do you think if you met another version of yourself, would you fall in love with them? Probably. If I saw these curls over there, I'd be like, oh, who is this? Getting seasick just looking at those curls, ayo. I feel like I'd get along with myself for like three hours and then get really annoyed. While this wasn't the case for Harley Quinn, however, when she met herself, she actually fell in love. We see it all go down in 2016's Harley's Little Black Book. From Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti, we get to see six issues where Harley teams up with other big hitters. Like one issue, she teams up with Superman and another with Lobo, which looks cool. It's like straight from the 90s. It's great. Harley has to take on Superman, Muhammad Ali style, a lot of fun stuff in here. Things get unique when Harley meets herself in one of these fun alternate universes. And the two of them hit it off. This whole issue was trippy, but it left me wondering if I could ever fall in love with myself in real life. Would you guys get along with a version of yourselves, another version of yourselves? Let us know in the comments. I'm genuinely curious here. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up while you're at it, that would be super awesome. Thank you so much for your support, especially while we're working from home still for a little bit longer. We're back in the studio soon. But in the meantime, thank you so much for your constant support. Let's get right back to this list. Number eight, Wonder Woman and Superman. Sometimes key intimate moments are hard to conceal when you have the powers that these people have. Specifically the Justice League. I mean, Wonder Woman and Superman, they're different. They're a bit stronger than our average folk. So after the Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller decided to dive into an intimate moment with the two of them. Now, of course, they're superheroes, so this caused massive tidal waves, volcanoes are going off, people have to evacuate islands. It's a nightmare for everybody that's not Wonder Woman and Superman. They're like, great, looks like a good time. We have to leave our island now, so have fun. That's really good. This also isn't the first time Superman and Wonder Woman have been together either. See, DC Comics actually tried it back in Action Comics issue 600, but clearly it didn't work too well. Number seven, Superman and Big Barda. Ah, yes, the classic storyline, The Suicide Snare. Now, this issue was released with Action Comics number 593 back in 1987. So just seven issues prior to what we just saw. So now we have Superman on the cover, but this time he's hooking up with Mr. Miracle's girl, Big Barda and Soups. How, why, what? I have so many questions. What's going on here? Also, why is Mr. Miracle just watching? What is this? What's going on? Mr. Miracle, AKA Scott Free, goes home to find Darkseid chilling on his couch, immediately asking where Barda is. Darkseid gives him a tape to play. So scary, the scariest thing ever also. And he clicks play and the tape is not America's Funniest Home Videos. No, the tape is Big Barda and Sleaze. Now it's a little romantic to say the least, the way that they're dancing and partaking with each other. It's, you know, I can't say it, but you know what's going on. They don't show it, but it's heavily implied some stuff. Now the idea was that mind control Barda and Superman would bring in all the views, like a Jake Paul fight. If they bring in all the views, they get all this money to watch these two and then that money goes towards them building a big army. I mean, sure, that's one way to make a buck. Maybe do an OnlyFans with Superman. Okay, sure. But I mean, if you can mind control Superman, maybe a magic show, I don't know, just an idea off the top of my head. I don't know, get creative, throw a mustache on him and a cool hat. They're not gonna know it's Superman. They're gonna think that this guy is just levitating. That or mind-controlled Barda. It's like, mm, 
Weird. Number six, Supergirl and Comet. There's no doubt that love is a major driving force with all of these superpowered beings, but some of the relationships here are just a bit too far-fetched and odd. It's kind of hard to follow when you can't get your mind off the fact that, I don't know, like the time Supergirl fell in love with Comet, her pet horse. Let's talk about that one. Now it's a sapient horse with magical powers who at one point was actually a centaur in ancient Greece. So it wasn't always a horse which makes it better. It makes it better, I think. I don't know, maybe. He was once a handsome warrior man, kind of. Now, of course, super animals aren't new to DC Comics. We also have Crypto the Super Dog, who came from Superman's past, Streaky the Super Cat, Beepo the Super Monkey. We have all the super pets, all the super animals. It's great. So Comet was this pet from the future. So he became Supergirl's pet and then he became a human in Action Comics issue 301. This is big news. So what ended up happening now was a comet that was passing Earth, like an actual comet, now we get it, turned him into a human man named Bronco Bill, a rodeo star. Then Supergirl and Bronco Bill fell in love and dated for some time until he turned back into an animal. This has so many layers to it, so many layers of weird. Like she made up with her horse, right? This, that's the thing we're talking about, that's the main idea that she made out with her pet horse. Number six, she made out with a horse. That's what it should be. Number five, Killer Croc and Orca. Orca, AKA Grace Ballin and Killer Croc. Now I gotta say, they kind of seem like they're made for each other. They're giant, they're terrifying villains that I never want to run into. And the two get pretty close in the Injustice Elseworld story because here Killer Croc and Orca are actually married. Yeah, holy matrimony, holy matri, holy moly. These things are big, very big. What a loud wedding. It's nice when it starts off with just the two being married, you know, no mind control, nobody's got to turn into a baby, just villains getting along in villain ways. Great. Plenty of fish in the sea and Killer Croc chosen Orca. How sweet. Things get even more serious in Injustice Volume 2, Issue 42, when Orca walks in, simply announces that she's pregnant, and the first response we hear is a well-timed spit take. And then Killer Croc stands up and he's like, well, I should probably go. And then everyone else is like, okay, Killer Croc, sounds good. What? Number four, Marissia Rab and Hal Jordan. Pink Elephants is the title of issue 212 of Green Lantern Corps. We have Hal Jordan and he's being eyed down by Arishia Rab. Now, the weird thing is, Arishia is only 13 years old. That's not okay. Now the way they dodged this in the storyline was by having Arishia use her power ring to make herself older. But does that make it okay? No. It doesn't. Like, did readers see this and go, whoa, 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 hold on, what are you talking? Oh, it's fine. That's fine now. No way, Arisia is like, hey, I loved you because you were the most handsome man I'd ever seen, and because you treated me like a real Green Lantern, even though I was young. Even Guy Gardner is watching like, I'm gonna throw up. I'm gonna throw up seeing this. That's a gross, this is gross. No, this is very gross. Even Hal Jordan's grossed out. He's like, okay, okay, please don't, yeah, stop. We don't have to talk about it. Don't remind me. And sorry for reminding you. Number three, Superman and Maxima. Making her first appearance in Action Comics issue 647, Maxima is the oldest child of the royal family of Almarac. Now she came to Earth in search for a suitable mate, of course choosing Superman who, you know, can do everything in the world. So she's like, yeah, super babies, let's do it. But like we saw with Wonder Woman, just because they were compatible doesn't mean it's gonna necessarily work. Superman rejected her offer, so she went and teamed up with Brainiac for a bit before ultimately turning against him and joining the Reform Justice League. Now down the road, she again offered herself to Superman because, you know, she's a better person this time around. She went from being a villain, now she's on the good side. She's like, hey, I've changed. Wanna have six kids? But again, Superman said no. Besides, he was married to Lois Lane at this point, so it's just not in the cards. It's just not happening. Sorry, Maxima. But in Adventures of Superman Annual 3, we see her dream finally come true. Tragically. Because after an untimely passing, Lois Lane wasn't necessarily in the picture anymore. Ooh, sorry. So Clark actually felt responsible for not being able to save her life. So he left Earth. He couldn't bear Earth anymore. Felt like he genuinely had no reason to stay on this planet. That's, that's love. Heavy, but love. And while Superman was being attacked in space, Maxima came to the rescue. And Superman, well, he decided to stick around. Not having anywhere else to go, he figured, eh, why not? So this escalated in the comics to a point where it's implied that the two eventually did have kids. So don't give up on love, guys, because they might leave their home planet and you might meet them. Number two, Robin and Wonder Girl. This next one is absolutely insane, okay? So after the death of Superboy in Infinite Crisis, Robin's plan was to try and replace him with a clone using Superboy's 
corpse. Now, of course, that was way easier said than done, and this failed over and over and over again. So Wonder Girl walks in and sees Robin clearly frustrated at all these failures, and he starts to destroy all of these attempts of a clone. Guts everywhere, it's so gross, probably smells horrible. So they both ended up bonding over how upset they were at the loss of Superboy, and then with all the remains of the clones just laying all over the ground, they started to make out. So while they were still crying, they were kissing, they were bonding, there's guts everywhere. I mean, sure, that's normal to a degree, but like clean up the guts maybe, or go into another room where there's no guts of the person you're crying over, you know? Just an idea. Number one, Beast Boy, Terra, and Deathstroke. Hey, three and one, how lovely. So we met Terra when she was running away from a giant scorpion, and naturally the Titans came to the rescue to help. But help is not something she really needed per se. She was actually leading the scorpion into a trap the whole time, where she would then use her powers to finish it off with a stone bridge collapsing. Now, when she introduces herself to the team, Beast Boy gets all shy, turns himself into a turtle, which is great, it's hilarious. She loves it, I love it, we all love it. Now, Terra and Beast Boy are close, close enough that Beast Boy convinces Terra to stay with the team and train. But during that conversation by the water, Terra accidentally moves a rock that Beast Boy is sitting on. So now, it's implied that she can't really control her powers. This is a big deal. But the next day when she's being tested by the team, she kills it, she actually does really well. Then later on, Tara and Slade Wilson cross paths and Slade explains how the team is just gonna get rid of her once they realize she can't control her powers and that he can surely help with that. Okay, easy dude. So she tells him to beat it and eventually she becomes a full member of the Titans. Now during a rendezvous with Beast Boy, they both cross paths with Slade Wilson and then he reveals how Terra had just been a spy the whole time. And to make matters even worse somehow, in the Judas Contract storyline in the comics, one of the main reasons behind the betrayal is that she and Deathstroke were actually in love the whole time. Number 10, Superman and Wonder Woman. Some people love this pairing. Some people prefer Diana with Batman. Some people would rather she was with Steve Trevor. And then there are some of us, like myself, who just think Diana is a strong woman who don't need no man. Superman with Wonder Woman, however, is admittedly not that weird. Both are powerful heroes who respect and care for one another. So, what's so wrong with them hooking up and having a relationship? We've seen alternate realities and Elseworlds stories where this has worked. Heck, they've even had children together. The moment when DC overstepped, though, it seems with these two and made it kind of weird, was when they made their relationship a permanent fixture of the New 52 main continuity, which honestly just made it kind of strange. Especially when we we then were forced to watch them get intimate and talk dirty just about everywhere and almost all the time because I guess they're both just that invincible and super and I guess horny. I, I don't know. Not something we really needed to see, was it? Number nine. Batman and Black Canary. These two are definitely an odd pairing, but of course not the weirdest on the list. More just an unusual ship. They have hooked up plenty in the all-star Batman and Robin comic book universe, but if you're one of those people that prefers to claim that alternate realities don't count, there's still a lot of weird romantic moments we've had from the original Justice League of America days. Now technically this is all considered Earth 1 now, but these issues came out in the late 60s, early 70s, before Earth 1 was really established is, well, being Earth-1, and anyways, call me crazy, but I consider Earth-1 to be pretty close to the main continuity, simply because, I mean, it was the main continuity before it was retconned into an alternate reality following Crisis. Anyways, over on Earth-1, back in Justice League of America issue 88, we got a weird love triangle moment featuring Black Canary, who was stuck choosing randomly between Batman and Green Arrow after sharing a passionate kiss previously with the Bats. So their relationship technically goes way, way back. So far back that it's part of the now alternate reality that was once main continuity pre-crisis. Number eight, Arsenal and Cheshire. This was a weird one before the new 52, but even after it still stayed as a pretty bizarre relationship that some writers just still love to ship. Arsenal is Roy Harper, originally known as Green Arrow's ward and sidekick Speedy. He was Speedy before Mia Dearden took over. Roy has a pretty weird and deadly relationship on and off with villain and assassin Cheshire. Despite being terrible for one another, however, these two even at one point had a child together, and oddly enough, it became the best part of their relationship. Roy's relationship with his daughter Leanne was one of arguably the only good things to come out of this weird romance with Cheshire. However, before New 52 happened, Leanne died, and we got a very strange moment where Roy and Cheshire started blaming one another for the tragedy, and then that fight escalated to a passionate moment between the two. Not a 
thing usually in real life by the way. And Roy both wanted to sleep with Cheshire following the loss of their daughter while also finding it difficult to get intimate due to his intense sadness. We also got a weird moment later on when Cheshire tried to use the death of their daughter to guilt trip Roy into helping her, implying he owed her because their daughter died while in his care. This is some intense and weird stuff. Number seven, Lois Lane and Jonathan Carroll. The fact that this relationship happened, I guess, made sense since this is when Lois and Superman's marriage was basically erased in the new 52, but it still was a strange pairing. Superman ended up with Wonder Woman, which was also kind of weird to be honest, though a lot of fans did enjoy that pairing. But Lois got stuck with Jonathan Carroll. Now, who is Jonathan? Well, he's basically an obnoxious and forgettable character who at one point also showed up. On panel without his nipples. Where did he leave those nipples? I don't know. Their romance only lasted a few issues and ended with Lois erasing some of his memories before leaving him because I guess she didn't want him calling her ever again. Forget my number, but literally. Number six, Harley Quinn and the Joker. So these two aren't really a weird romance in terms of understanding just why or how they got together. They're more of a weird romance in the fact that so many people still ship them today, years after they've broken up and after it's really been established that their relationship was extremely toxic. For for both of them. Now, these two really, really don't belong together. Of course, unless we're talking about some kind of magical alternate reality like White Knight, which features a reformed version of the Joker, Jack Napier, who only seeks to redeem himself and basically takes on the role of hero once he regains his sanity, continuing to work on his mental health. But we're not talking about that version of their relationship, are we? Even villains don't deserve a relationship as toxic as Harley Quinn and the Joker's typically is. Their relationship is not only toxic, it's and destructive. Still, the world keeps turning and plenty of fans still to this day keep shipping these two and hoping we'll see Harley return to the Joker's side once more. I'm not trying to ship shame, but I just personally find the love for this relationship shocking and confusing considering present continuity. But hey, people gonna ship. People gonna ship. Number five, Huntress and Robin. This relationship comes to us from Earth number two, where Huntress is actually the daughter of Bruce Wayne and Selena Kyle, as opposed to the more common Huntress that we've come to know as Helena Bertinelli. Bertinelli actually also has had a relationship with Dick Grayson, though admittedly a much less weird one. On Earth two, Robin and Helena Wayne Huntress are therefore kind of like brother and sister, as both sort of grew up together under the guidance of Bruce, which makes all the flirting and tension between them super awkward. At one point, Dick only makes it more awkward when he acknowledges that he remembers helping to change Helena when she was just a baby. He also at one point breaks into her apartment when she's moved out of the Wayne Manor. Dick surprises Helena with his presence when she emerges from the shower, waiting for her in her apartment. Um, number four, Superman and Supergirl. We've actually seen these two get married in the comics, although it was a strange sight, at least those two versions of our heroes were not related. Linda Danvers tied the knot with Silver Age Superman and Linda Danvers, while Supergirl was not actually Superman's cousin at all. Kind of a different thing, she's not, she's not Kara. Her story was a lot more complex than Kara's was. Linda and kal would even have a child together, Ariella Kent, but although this does doesn't seem as weird when given the context. It was also once implied in Action Comics issue number 289 that if Superman could marry anyone, he'd want to marry his cousin Supergirl. At least that's what Superman said when Kara revealed she had been trying to play matchmaker and find Superman a suitable woman to marry. Cal L reveals that Supergirl is the only woman suited to marrying him, but of course that they could not marry because on Krypton, cousins aren't allowed to get married. He does acknowledge though that in some countries of earth that is allowed. Just what are you suggesting Superman? Why'd you bring that up? He's like we can't do it but you know here there's some places we could do it technically. Number three, Captain Marvel and Stargirl. So this doesn't inherently sound that bad. Captain Marvel or Shazam as we now know him is really Billy Batson, a teenage boy who Stargirl, a teenage superhero, finds herself interested in. For a time the two date and Stargirl is obviously interested in Billy, not his adult hero form of Shazam slash Captain Marvel. However, not everyone who is part of the Justice Society of America knows that Billy Batson is Captain Marvel, which makes things super awkward. Eventually, Jay Garrett 
Eric as the Flash ends up bringing up his concerns about the relationship with Captain Marvel, who he believes is a grown man dating a 16 year old girl. Not willing to reveal the secret of his true identity, Billy decides to break things off with Stargirl and leaves the Justice Society. He breaks up with Stargirl while in his Captain Marvel form too, which kind of just makes this whole thing weirder. Number 2 Supergirl and Comet the Super Horse One of the weirdest DC romances comes to us from the time Supergirl ended up in a relationship with her horse, Comet. Of course, Comet wasn't really just a horse, he was actually originally a centaur named Byron, who Cersei attempted to help turn into a full human. Unfortunately, this went awry and resulted in him actually being turned into a full horse instead. The horse who possessed telepathy, super strength, and immortality at least. In other words, a super horse. Eventually, Comet met a sorcerer who could help to reverse some of the spell that made him a full horse, but only some of it. Comet was then granted the ability to turn human whenever a comet passed, and it was during this time that he sought out and pursued a romantic relationship with Supergirl while in his human form because no matter his appearance, he would always love her. Ah, uh, it's so weird. Number 1 Batman and Batgirl You might think it's strange that I decided to put this point above Supergirl and her super horse, but honestly, I just find it to be an even more strange ship than that previous one. Even if we're talking outside of the animated Killing Joke film, which literally allowed us to see these two get intimate on screen, well, I mean, almost, we obviously cut away from the actual deed because, you know, there's kids watching and such. We also saw Barbara Gordon, daughter of Commissioner Gordon, Batman's good friend, and Bruce Wayne himself get shipped together really awkwardly in a comic based on the animated Batman Beyond series. In this comic, it's revealed that not only did Barbara and Bruce have an intimate relationship, well, basically Dick was absent, but we also learn that Bruce got her pregnant as well. Yikes. Why did this have to bleed into other things? Why did this have to be a thing at all? Number 10, Speeding Bullets. Basically a multiversal DC Elseworlds story that answers the question, what if Superman didn't just have powers but was also rich? That's basically what is going on here in Speeding Bullets. In this story, Superman wasn't raised by the Kents, but instead was taken in and adopted by the Waynes. And he becomes, you guessed it, Bruce Wayne. After the death of Thomas and Martha, Bruce becomes Batman, but the difference is this version of Batman has tech, money, smarts, and superpowers. Lex also becomes a mess of a villain in this world. While still being Superman's nemesis, he's also Batman's nemesis rolled into one with an extra little dash of pain just for good measure, I guess. So here we get a villain who is Lex, Joker, and the Penguin all in one. Oh goody. Just what none of us necessarily wanted or needed. And yet, we got it. This also doesn't do much to enhance his motivation for villainy, which like his identity is also kind of all over the place. Still, the premise behind this Elseworld story is pretty cool, but unfortunately it doesn't add enough when it comes to offering a twist or different perspective to either the Superman or Batman mantle. Number 9, Batman and Captain America. A gloriously weird and awesome comic. This DC multiversal story also happens to be a DC Marvel crossover issue featuring Batman, his sidekick. Robin and Captain America and his sidekick Bucky. Both Cap and Batman end up joining together and then swapping sidekicks. Their villains also seem to have a team up as Red Skull and Joker come together, but this is also the famous issue the Joker insists that Red Skull is too evil even for him. He may be a criminal lunatic, but after all, he's an American criminal lunatic, and he can't stand by when it comes to abiding by Red Skull's history and motivations. So not only do we get to see some great team Ups, but we also get to see a full out fight break out between these two iconic villains. Thanks, John Byrne. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you love Elseworld stories and all of the weird, wacky things that go on in the multiverse when it comes to just alternate worlds, let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. And hey, maybe we can do some more Elseworlds lists for you. Cause yeah, there's lots of kooky stories out there. Number eight, the Superman monster. Frankenstein, but make it Superman. There are lots of retellings of classic tales when we look into the realm of Elseworlds. And the story of Frankenstein is not one that is left untouched. Actually, I feel like this story gets interpreted a few times throughout the Elseworlds stories. 
feel like I've seen at least three different versions of Frankenstein retold in Elseworlds. I still have yet to see Dr. Seuss retellings though in the world of DC, which are some classic kids tales that do eke their way surprisingly into Marvel at times. In the Superman monster, Lex Luthor takes the role of creator and Superman ends up as his monster. You might think this sounds familiar, considering it's also kind of the premise for the main continuity origin story of Bizarro, but this creation, while starting out similar to Bizarro, eventually goes full on hero and full on Superman by the end of it. That means in this story of Frankenstein, the creator ends up the monster, while the monster ends up the hero. What a twist. Number 7, Justice Riders. Because it's an inevitability that at some point, we have to turn to the Wild West for inspiration when it comes to an Elseworlds story. We just, we've got to go there at some point. And so we have Justice Riders. Justice Riders reimagines the DC Universe as existing during the time of the Wild West and adapts the characters to kind of fit their surroundings somewhat. As such, Wonder Woman becomes a Texan sound and sheriff and Martian Manhunter gets to sport a poncho and a cowboy hat. Which honestly, this is one you might want to check out just for that, because that's great. This is the Wild West, baby. There are also plenty of shootouts and bar brawls, some with cyborg enemies involved. As ridiculous as this premise is, I will say it's executed well and it also looks fantastic, so. Number 6, The Reaching Hand. Honestly, what a strange story this one is. It features Batman as an occult detective trying to solve the mystery of Elongated Man's death. Unfortunately, it seems as though Elongated Man wasn't alone in his body, and there was a force of darkness within him who continues to seek to spread gloom and doom wherever it can. This story features a lot of restless nights for Bruce as well, and unfortunately, he ends up too late to save Jimmy Olsen. Not Jimmy Olsen, who ends up brutally murdered by Swirly. At least that's what it looks like to me. He's just head down in the toilet and they're like, he's been murdered. <laughs> or he was just being mistreated by the other staff at his workplace, but no, he's dead. Death by Swirly. Bruce also is too late to save his friends or Gotham in the end. At least that's what's implied. This one ends pretty bleakly, so yeah. Also, this is back from when we had like Elseworlds, like giant sizes, so there would be like a bunch of short stories in there. Kinda like What If, and I kinda, I like that style. More stories though than what if, because those are normally two. Sometimes only one. Number five, Elseworlds finest, Supergirl slash Batgirl. You can't go wrong with a jacked Joker when it comes to weird multiversal stories. Looking real jacked, baby. Elseworlds finest is weird, but also kind of cool. It focuses on Barbara Gordon and Kara Zor-El. Batgirl and Supergirl, respectively, who are guardians of Gotham and Metropolis, as in this world, there was never a Batman or a Superman. The two of them team up to take on the manipulative and traitorous Lex Luthor, and as I said, a really swole version of the Joker. It's a strange one, but it's also kind of a great one. Number 4, Batman Slash the Demon, A Tragedy. In this Elseworlds story, we get to explore a horrifying fantastical world where magic exists. Here, Bruce Wayne is not the Batman, instead suffering from an allergy to moonlight. He is a restless sleeper, and it turns out this is because he's actually bonded to the demon Etrigan. Oh my goodness. It takes Bruce a while to figure this out though, but in the end, he is too late to save his girlfriend Glenda. Poor Glenda. The best thing he can do according to Merlin is to wipe his memory, which will also mean he has no recollection of Glenda, oh no. Merlin claims that this will save her. Unfortunately, it doesn't, as Etrigan taking over Bruce in the nighttime does end up still killing her. But hey, at least Bruce doesn't remember her, which actually seems to have been Merlin's plan all along. You see, in order to keep the demon trapped within Bruce, his forgetfulness is necessary. There is no way to save Glenda really in any case most likely, and Merlin was just saying Saying that to try to get Bruce to, you know, do what he wanted him to do. But hey, at least uh, Bruce doesn't remember her, so at least he won't be sad about it. Number three, Brotherhood of the Bat. Have you ever wondered to yourself what the DC Universe would be like if every member of the League of Assassins was dressed up and also weirdly happened to resemble Batman? No? Me neither. But too bad, because we get to know what that would be like in this Elseworld story. I mean, not even too bad, it's kind of really great in a weird way. Brotherhood of the Bat takes place in a post-apocalyptic future where Ra's al Ghul decides that the League of Assassins, they need some new costumes. New Bat-themed costumes that all very much resemble alternative takes on Batman's outfits. Also, check out some of the notes on Ra's al Ghul's design sketches here. That is honestly my favorite part of this story. Just seeing all these, it's like there's like little notes in red. It's like, too, is this cape too much? 
you can never have too much cape, just so you know. Just so you know, Raish, no such thing. Number two, Batman Nosferatu. If you want something weird in a sort of horror-based and very artistic way, we've got you. Batman Nosferatu was actually part of an Elseworlds story series that delve into the German expressionist period. This story seems to take some inspiration from Nosferatu and the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Not only is the art style very different and unique, but the whole tone and the style of the dialogue is as well. The story has a lot going on, but mainly it follows the horrors of Dr. Arkham. To give you like the briefest summary ever, because as I said, there's a lot going on in the story, it's also quite long. The story mainly centers around Dr. Arkham and his experiments and creations, including one called The Laughing Man. Oh, I wonder who that's supposed to be. A reanimated creature made from various corpse parts. In the end, Bruce Wayne's son ends up dying and is resurrected as the Nosferatu, sort of cyborg monster creature who ends up taking on and defeating the Laughing Man. I wonder who Nosferatu is supposed to stand for here. Any guesses? Number one, Batman slash Lobo. Like all of the weirdest comic stories out there across the multiverse, this one also features Lobo. Here, Joker hires the mercenary to ruin Batman's reputation and then finally kill his nemesis. Lobo sets out dressed as Batman and begins to muck up the streets, killing Batman's villains in gruesome ways to make sure that people know that Batman is no hero. He's like, what, does Batman have a no kill policy? Pfft, not anymore. Also, the deaths have to be gruesome because this is a Lobo comic after all, so yeah, they're all pretty... There's something. I don't even know if we can show them here. In the end, the Joker is forced to call off Lobo after it's revealed that Batman is actually his long lost twin brother, Bruce Wayne. You see, Joey and Bruce were apparently separated at a young age. I mean, does it get any weirder than this? Number 10, Tales from the Dark Multiverse, Batman Hush. I actually really love this story, but it's also kinda out there. Especially when you consider it has its own sort of theme song and a very creepy tone. In Tales from the Dark Multiverse Hush, Bruce Wayne is the one who becomes a version of the Hush character. It would be more accurate though to say that he becomes a version of Hush and Batman if they were kinda like combined together. Here, Thomas Elliot instead becomes a rich billionaire playboy and also corrupt senator, allying himself with Talia al Ghul. He manages to make it so that Bruce was locked away in Arkham Asylum. Despite feeling slightly guilty about doing this to his childhood friend, overall Elliot is pretty okay with the way Bruce is imprisoned and treated there. However, after faking his death, Bruce Wayne manages to escape Arkham and becomes Elliot's worst nightmare. And just for a fun fact, he doesn't go by hush in this one though, he's the silenced. Shh. Get it? Still like hush. Number 9, JLA The Nail. This is an Elseworlds story that centers around a literal nail. The nail in question is one that punches Martha and Jonathan Kent's tire, thereby preventing them from intercepting and adopting little baby Cal Al, who would grow up to become Superman. Or at least he would have grown up to become Superman if that's what happened. In this world, instead, there is seemingly no Superman. As such, Lex Luthor is successful in making the JLA a band of outlaws. Instead of them being celebrated heroes, they're kind of considered to be somewhat criminal, despite of course their noble intentions. What I will say is at least a lot of this artwork is pretty good. Most of the limited series ends up being kinda dull, save for a few scenes and plot points. The parts that I found the most interesting were one where Selena gets therapy while sexy posing on a desk, another being a fight involving Joker with anti-grav mitts versus Batman, which takes place after Joker has successfully killed Batgirl and Robin. Batman ends up broken as a result of the Joker's actions here. We later learn that the Superman of this universe is basically a very sensitive Jimmy Olsen who is bonded with the remaining traces of Kal-El's DNA found in this crash landed spaceship. Jimmy doesn't like it when people laugh at him. He ends up in a fight with the real Kal-El, another interesting part of the three issue series, who it turns out was adopted by the Amish, hence why he never became a hero, as he preferred to stay within his community. So we get an Amish Superman and then we also get Jimmy Olsen Superman, but he's pretty much evil. Also, what is that costume he's wearing? <laughs> Sorry, Jimmy. I didn't mean to laugh at you. Sorry. All right, friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want even more multiversal tales, let us know that you love it by giving this video a thumbs up. And also, let us know in the comments what other multiversal tales you have loved or you have thought are super weird or that you loved and thought were weird. I mean, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Number eight, Tales from the Dark Multiverse, Wonder Woman, War of the Gods. I don't even know what to really make of this multiversal story. All I can tell you is buckle in because this dark multiverse story is 
Yeah, dark. To be fair to this one shot though, I don't really even know what to make of the War of the Gods story in the main continuity, which I also found a little confusing. So it makes sense that this is where I would be as well with the dark multiverse version. A little, a little confused. In this story, the Amazons of Themyscira end up in a war with the United States. When Diana is pulled into a battle with Hecate as a result of these events, where in the main continuity, Hecate was defeated by Wonder Woman's lasso of truth, here she just ends up planting a seed with in Diana's mind. Diana defeats her, but only temporarily. Following the death of Hippolyta, her mother, Diana is left weak, fearful, alone, and resentful. And this is when Hecate is able to take over. Unable to free her, all of Wonder Woman's friends die trying to. The only way to contain Hecate Wonder Woman is with magic, and many of her magical colleagues actually die in the attempt to do so. Hecate as such ends up chained, but of course so is Diana, unable to find the hope to escape her own internal prison. Of course, like most dark multiversal tales, we end on a pretty dark and tragic note. But that's okay, Zatanna's never gonna give up. Number seven, JLA, Act of God. Admittedly, this is a cool premise, but it just doesn't make uh, a lot of sense, which is what's weird about it. In JLA, Act of God, and Elseworlds three issue miniseries, we get to explore a world where all the heroes of Earth have simultaneously lost their powers. Well, at least almost all of them anyways. How did this happen? Um, black light? Somehow the world being hit with a flash of black light results in almost everyone losing their powers. I guess normally superheroes like don't go to raves or anything where black light is, I feel like, very common. Although this is attributed to the black light, some might call it an act of God. A later on, very suddenly, devoutly Christian Diana Prince at least would probably claim that. Diana, haven't you met gods? <laughs> How does that make sense? What's really ridiculous is in the first issue as we go through the moment this happened, the world over, we get to see just how diverse not only everyone's powers are, but also when it comes to the source of their powers, just how diverse it is. In one page we go from Steel losing complete control of his systems and suit as he plummets to his doom, to Aquaman losing his ability to connect with the creatures of the sea telepathically, and his ability to breathe underwater. At the same time, Kyle Rayner also has lost control control of his Green Lantern ring, which seems to now just be, I guess, a really unique and trendy looking accessory. How could a flash of black light affect almost everyone in this same way? Like I said, it's a cool premise, kinda wonky execution though. Like how is Steel affected by this? Didn't Steel make his suit? I'm confused. Number 6. Facets what happens when we get to see the Teen Titans as they be in a fantasy setting? Well, a whole lot of weirdness. Raven, of course, ends up evil, known as a deadly and beautiful sorceress, Queen Raven. She creates her own loyal servant and accomplice with Victor Stone, or at least she tries to, transforming him permanently into a cyborg. It turns out this isn't all that Raven's been up to, though. She has a whole collection of prisoners whom she has transformed in some way, and when Cyborg refuses to join her, she also contemplates holding him there with the rest of them. So apparently she does this a lot. Seems like her deals with people don't usually work out. I guess she's just hoping that one day that'll change. She's like, I'll just keep doing it. Eventually someone will be loyal to me. If I try it enough times, it's gotta work. In this story, Coriander is a prisoner of some goblin mages who use cosmic energy to transform her into Starfire. The comic features an all-out battle between Raven and Starfire, joined, of course, by the rest of the Titans. Nightwing goes on a trip inside Phantasm's cloak, literally it looks like he's tripping out, and eventually Trigon joins the party when he is summoned by his daughter Raven. You can check it all out in the 1994 New Titans Annual. It's weird. It's definitely weird. Also, some of these outfits are interesting. Number five, Superman at Earth's End. I don't even know where to begin with this comic. Oh boy. Okay, so Superman here is one of the first iterations of, of course, the old man heroes to come that we've come to love so much. See, before there was old man Logan, there was old man Supes. In this Elseworld story, we are in a post-apocalyptic future where machines rule supreme and mutants basically run amok. Also, there is an army of Batmen and vicious biker gangs because I mean, why not? The year I believe is 
2102. So possibly this is what we'll be dealing with in just over 80 years time. Honestly, the way things are going, I could maybe see that being our future. Superman is recharging and recuperating his strength when he hears about the plan to nuke Gotham City. He aims to save the city, but of course without doing any killing because you know, he's Superman. And of course, no guns because he's Superman. Except for the part where he uses guns to kill people. Except for that part. Mostly robo and really bad people though, so I guess for soups it doesn't count. It features the famous I am a man memeable moment, which actually was shouted in response to an android by the way, so out of context it's really weird, but within context it actually like kinda makes some sense. It's still pretty weird, but it's not as weird. Also, shortly after claiming that he doesn't need weapons, Superman chooses to wield a ridiculous mega gun known as the Expunger. It's crazy. I just love that he's like, I don't need weapons because I have powers. I would never do that. And then like flip to like two pages later and he's like, look at this giant expunger. I'm gonna use this mega gun. Number four, all star Batman and Robin. Not so much a story as a full series, but I have other full series on this list, so it's fine. All Star Batman and Robin consists of 10 issues, all of which are pretty weird when it comes to the depiction and characterization of a lot of our favorite superheroes, villains, and their allies even. Once again, we get a super jacked version of Joker in this comic. We also get a version of Vicki Vale who seems far more obsessed with Superman's manhood and dates with Bruce Wayne than any kind of serious reporting. And of course, then there are Batman and Robin. What a dynamic. Batman in this comic is the worst kind of hero, an entitled one. This is the version he refers to himself as the goddamn Batman and makes Dick eat rats and sleep in the Batcave initially because he's Batman and he can do that. He also torments Hal Jordan Green Lantern by painting himself Robin and the entire room and corridor yellow and also serves and consumes yellow food and drink around him. With Batman enjoying some lemonade and Robin devouring what appears to be an all yellow ice cream cone. All star Batman and Robin has to be one of the weirdest multiverses out there. And every time I go back to it, I'm like, what is happening? What is this characterization? <laughs> Number three, JLA created equal. Okay, so All Star Batman and Robin is the not so great kind of weird, but JLA created equal is just the weird kind of weird. In this two part Elseworld story, we get a glimpse into a world where all the men, or almost all the men, were killed off by an unexpected and sudden plague. The only two left alive are Superman and Lex Luthor in this reality, and yet for all the powerful women who remain, this book sure manages to still be about the male characters within it. In Created Equal, Superman attempts to help the rest of the new, almost all female JLA figure out a way to repopulate the Earth. I say almost because Superman's still there, so yeah. The main concern is how to ensure the survival of the human male gender as if they made clones with their technology and resources, they'd actually only be able to produce female ones. I guess they can't like tamper with the genes. They can't like tamper with the DNA or I don't know how you make clones anyway, so I probably shouldn't tell other people how to do it. Eventually, Lois Lane and Clark Kent end up conceiving a son who is born and named Adam. He accidentally hugs his mother to death, and then Lex, being Lex, unleashes a plan to take control of all the young men who were created and raised on Themyscira, thanks to Adam's existence and his resilience. Also, he makes them all bald, because this is Lex Luthor. So, yeah. Oh, uh, what a weird story. Come and join me and also I'll be bald because you all have lovely hair and it offends me. Number two, a Batman reptilian. Ah uh, yes, the story of an alien baby that belongs to Killer Croc because he was influenced by aliens while inside his mother's womb, which is how he's even mutated and also makes him like, I guess, a hybrid alien human creation technically. In this beautiful yet bizarre story, Batman is attempting to track down whoever is killing all of his rogues. What he finds out though, is that it isn't any one of the other villains, but Croc's baby that he just just gave birth to. Killer Croc, of course, didn't know that he could do that. I mean, neither did we. It turns out that this is a result of him being part alien in origin, or being tampered with by aliens when he was like a fetus. The newborn babe, it turns out, just wants its mama, but for what purpose remains to be seen. Killer Croc can't nurture it, as you know, he doesn't have like the biological equipment for that. After we get through that whole slog of that's not gonna work, it's also implied that the giant alien monster baby wants Croc to mate with it. 
which is also thankfully out of the question when it comes to Croc's willingness. So thank goodness, because I thought, this better not be where this is going, oh my goodness. Did I mention that Batman is also a huge jerk throughout this entire series? Cause yeah, this is Garth Ennis behind the writing wheel and that is very much a thing. Which I'm not surprised by, that's kind of Ennis' whole thing, so. Yeah. I actually like Batman being a butt in that story more than I like him being a butt in uh, Frank Miller's <laughs> All Star, so yeah. Number one, Batman Last Night on Earth. This one was where the thumb came from in part one of this list. I had intended to actually include this story there, but then I got distracted by the Batman and Lobo crossover. Understandably so, I think, because that's also super weird. But that's fine, because it just means that Last Night on Earth gets a higher spot on this list of bizarre multiversal DC stories. Batman Last Night on Earth is a book that exists outside of the continuity and belongs to the DC Black Label line. Also, Reptilian is part of that same line, just so you know. Black Label primarily is made up of titles that that are more adult in terms of their content and their themes. Here, that translates to Batman wearing a straight jacket version of his suit in a post-apocalyptic future, where Joker is just a head in a jar. They also end up fighting giant monster baby Green Lantern constructs in issue number one, just to give you a sense of the level of weird that we're dealing with here. But it's like a fun weird. It's like a, I'd recommend this weird. <laughs> I give it two weird thumbs up. All right, number 10, Batmite. If you've heard of the extremely weirdly named Mr. Mixelpidalic, then you have a small understanding of the reality warping imps who inhabit the fifth dimension. This Batman mega fan is basically a small childlike imp who wears a loosely fitting homemade bat suit with a black lightning bolt symbol. But don't let his goofy looks trick you. He has nearly limitless magical abilities. He's not technically a hero, but he's also definitely not strictly a villain. A being of this level of power can't really be either because there's no way it would lose in whatever it wanted to do. He idolizes Batman and just wants to see him in action. So when Batman gets angry with him for being a nuisance, he usually sets things straight and just leaves, which is honestly kind of adorable. Number nine. Dino Cop. We have a few anthropomorphized characters on this list, but none of the others are dinosaurs. Dino Cop is from Earth 41, which is an Earth containing characters who are all pastiches of heroes from Image Comics. He is Rex Stegman, a humanoid dinosaur like character who is also a police officer, supposed to be the DC equivalent to Savage Dragon. He is absolutely dedicated to preserving the peace in his undinosaur blue collar worker way. He teams up with another superhero from Earth 41, Spore, who is supposed to be like Spawn. On, but more planty. I don't think his powers really matter too much when we talk about the weirdness of this character, but they are <clears throat> super strength. That's kind of it. He has increased stamina and is kind of pretty intelligent, but you know, nothing super. I think a dinosaur man hybrid police officer is weird enough to make this list on his own. So there you go. Number eight, the magic lantern. So take Shaggy from Scooby-Doo and give him the powers of Green Lantern and you've got the magic lantern of Earth 47. When it's groovy, when it's grim, we hum the living guru's hymn. When other lanterns lose their shit, we keep the magic lantern lit. I'm sure it's not the only thing that's lit. I wish I could just make this point a bunch of the stoner Green Lantern quotes. Hostility is for squares. Get with the blueprint. Are we groovy? Or do I gotta kick your non-non-Euclidean alien butts into the galaxy next door? The Magic Lantern is the Green Lantern to the Earth 47 Justice League, known as the Love Syndicate, whose members include Sunshine Superman, Shooting Star instead of Batman, Speed Freak, Brother Power, and The Geek. And they first appeared in Animal Man number 23, and were expanded upon in the Multiversity Guidebook. And every time I see them, I just wanna be a part of it. Number seven, Danny. The street. Yeah, no, I think this is the wildest concept for a hero I have ever heard of. In case you didn't clue in, or for that matter, actually didn't believe it, Danny the street is a living sentient street who can teleport to any city in the world. He was first introduced in Doom Patrol Volume 2, number 35 in 1990, and his main purpose and drive in this world is to bring happiness to those who inhabit whatever city he is currently at, giving those who have nowhere to go a place to rest their heads. It's nice. He likes to cross dress and dress himself in nice pink frilly decorations on some of his buildings, including weapon stores, he eventually became the headquarters of Doom Patrol. At one point, he grew to be Danny the World, and then he was deconstructed down to just Danny the Brick, and was even just the humble Danny the Alley at one point. Even saying that sentence makes me feel like, what am I doing with my life? I'm talking about awesome sentient streets. Mom would be proud. Number six, 
David Dibble. David Dibble dibble dabbled in some kind of dubious scientific debauchery, which decidedly turned him into Dig Dabby. Sorry, I mean, turned him into Big Baby, otherwise known as Behemoth. Hailing from Earth 8, where there are characters that seem to be DC's parody for Marvel characters. As part of the Retaliators, genius alternate name for the Avengers, Behemoth is basically the Hulk, turning from a scientist into an extremely strong monster. Only. The unfortunately named David Dibble, instead of turning into a green savage beast, turns into a giant blue mega baby. While he used to have a dumbed down intelligence when transformed, he has managed to recover his intelligence over time, just like how Marvel's Green Goliath did the same. The baby part of this is probably the strangest part, but it does reflect how Hulk basically acts like a tantruming toddler when he transforms. Number 5, Etrigan, or Etrigan, or Etrigan. Or Etr Etrigan. He could be considered really, really cool or really, really weird, honestly. Etrigan rocketed to an Earth of eternal twilight from the doomed planet of Camelot. Who does that sound like? Maybe another hero who rocketed to Earth from another planet that starts with a K? They sound similar because Etrigan is an alternate version of Superman with quote unquote overnatural abilities from Earth 13, a planet of the supernatural and occult. Etrigan fights evil in Merlin's name alongside the League of Shadows as the Super Demon. Together, the League of Shadows faced off against an invasion of super vampires. And later, Etrigan became part of the Supermen of the Multiverse, targeted by prophecy, and allies with them to come up with a plan to free the other alternate Supermen. A demon Superman is weird, but he won't be the weirdest alternate Superman to hit this list. Number 4, Yankee Poodle. I think I could effectively choose any one of the characters from the animal universe of Earth-C for this point, but of all the characters a part of the Zoo Crew, Ali Kedabra, Captain Carrot, Little Cheese, none really make me say what? Quite like Yankee Poodle. Gossip journalist Rova Barkett, an anthropomorphic poodle, <laughs> see what I did there? Would moonlight as Yankee Poodle, a superhero with the powers of magnetic manipulation that for some reason allowed her to shoot semi solidified electromagnetic blue colored stars with her right hand, push things away, and generate red and white stripes with her left hand in order to bring things to her. I don't know. If she put these powers together though, she can generate highly destructive magno blasts. But for me, the best use of her power is she could travel by forming a ramp of stripes in front of her while propelling herself along it by shooting stars behind her. No, I didn't make any of that up. Just just so we're clear on that. Number 3, Robert Rogers. This one has got a fun little twist. So, back in 2002, DC teamed up with Stan Lee of Marvel Comics fame and together they released the Just Imagine series, which is basically, why don't we let Stan Lee come and make a bunch of characters with the ideas of DC characters. It is actually honestly a great idea. One of those characters ended up being Robert Rogers from Just Imagine Shazam number 1. And yes, he is Stan Lee's Shazam. When I tell you he is absolutely nothing like the regular Shazam, I ain't kidding. I mean, other than saying Shazam to activate his powers. For starters, he is not a kid. He is actually an agent with Interpol, and he is assigned to the tough agent Carla Norell, who together go to India to hunt down criminal Gunga Khan. Secondly, he is empowered by the wizard Merlin to hunt down Morgana Le Fay. And finally, when he yells the word Shazam, he transforms into a giant, hairy, red fanged creature with a necklace of bones. Gosh, I love Stan Lee. Number two, Milkman Man. The DC Universe wiki says that Milkman Man. Man is an imperfect copy of Superman. Excuse me, DC Wiki. This is an improved copy of Superman. All that calcium, strongest bones you've ever seen. I, I bet. In JLA slash Doom Patrol special, the Doom Patrol has discovered that an interdimensional corporation called Retco has been stealing stories, reconfiguring them, and repackaging them for new markets. Retco has embedded itself into the current continuity, using the radioactive milk of psychic cows to quell the more dangerous impulses of the Justice League and turn them into heroes safe for the masses. That is literally the quote from the official summary, I am not even joking. Milkman Man has all the same powers as the famous Kryptonian superhero, only he's a milkman, and central part of the Community League of Rhode Island, a sinister group of pleasant spoken normal folks. Please just do yourself the favor of reading this story and trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Number 1, KFC. Okay, it's weird enough that we have Colonel Sanders in the mainline continuity, but after his adversary Colonel Sanders takes the memory of all but the second of KFC's 11 herbs and spices from Sanders' brain. He is visited by Colonel Arla Sanders of Earth 11, who relays some information. One, a 
Apparently, every Colonel Sanders variant in the multiverse is close with the flash of that universe, which is weird. Number two, she remembers a different herb and or spice from the recipe, meaning every alternate Colonel will remember a different herb or spice, which is weirder. And number three, with the help of her flash and her cosmic treadmill, they're going across the multiverse to form the multiversal team of Colonel Sanders, which is the weirdest part. There's Colonel Gaslight, Call Nell from Kingdom Come, the future Colonel Lad, Bizarro Colonel, Teen Titans Colonel, Comrade Sanders, and a Wild West Sanders. But my absolute favorite, and one that should make absolutely no sense, and if you really think about it, it is kind of sick and twisted, is the anthropomorphic Chicken Sanders from the post-apocalyptic Earth 51, whose second line is literally, Bok! Appetite. Number 10, the Wonder Twins. Oh, super friends. Sometimes you just introduce characters that are only a good idea in a kid's show. Jaina and Zan are alien twin sister and brother from the planet Exor, who have these super cool sounding power rings that activate when they fist bump and say, Wonder Twins, power activate. It sounds so cool, and it sorta is. Jaina can turn into any animal she chooses with her power. That's neat. But it's not as spectacular for Zan, who can only turn into water in one of its forms. He can turn into H2O, steam, or ice. Honestly, I could see it being used in some pretty cool ways, which is why they are so high up on this list, but still rather unique. Number nine, Doll Man. All right, so we take the G.I. Joe toy and Jada Pinkett Smith and we will make them superheroes. With the power to shrink down to six inches tall while retaining the strength of a full grown man, Daryl Dane, Doll Man, with his partner Martha Roberts, Doll Girl, is a founding member of the Freedom Fighters. He would fight crime during the 1940s and in World War II. That was when he first appeared in All Star Squadron number 60 in August of 1986. More recently, the power of size manipulation had a psychological effect on him, causing him to be confined to a mental institution and then trapped in his six inch size with other soldiers of similar height in a miniature world until get this, they fuse together as a mega monster form which just looks and sounds terrifying. Anyone ever seen Toy Soldiers? I love that movie back in the day. I am Archer, Emissary of the Gorgonites. No, I'm Adam, Emissary of Top 10 Nerd. And if you're enjoying this video so far, don't forget to smack that like button. It helps us know that you know that you like us, right? I don't know. Number eight, Prez. Prez Rickard, a teenager born to literally become president. He was the youngest president ever elected thanks to the lower eligibility age in his comic book. Prez, number one in 1973. As the young president, he fought legless vampires, a right wing militia led by the descendants of George Washington and evil chess players. His powers include advanced hand to hand combat, leadership, political science, and a healthy dash of charisma. His mother, Martha, another DC Martha mom, was his vice president president, with his sister becoming his secretary and his Native American friend Eagle Free being appointed as head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Honestly, a pretty strange character, but also super inspiring, especially for younger readers, I'm guessing. Number seven, Uncle Sam, the spirit of America bound to a talisman created by the founding fathers in an occult ritual who would take physical form by merging with a dying patriot. And he needs you and your money. Pretty please. He lives as long as America does and has taken part in every American conflict. He was the Minuteman in the Revolutionary War. In the Civil War, he split into two, Johnny Reb and Billy Yank. And in 1870, he officially became the Uncle Sam we all know and recognize. He's fought in World War I and World War II. Unsurprisingly, Uncle Sam's powers are proportionate to the United States faith in the ideals of liberty and freedom. And that list of powers is long. So of course, I will struggle to list them all out for you. <coughs> Possession, immortality, interdimensional teleportation, invulnerability, limited clairvoyance, super leaping, size alteration, superhuman reflexes, superhuman speed, superhuman stamina, and last but not least, superhuman strength. Oh, and most importantly, he can detect the whereabouts of patriotic objects like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So watch out, Nicolas Cage. Number six. Canterbury Cricket. After The Flash rewrote history in Flashpoint, this interesting character came to be in Flashpoint, the Canterbury Cricket number one in 2011. Jeremy Cricky, not to be confused with Jiminy Cricket, I'm sure, was a university student and con man until the Amazons attacked the country of England. He takes refuge in the Canterbury Cathedral, but was tracked by an Amazonian soldier. He begs for his life from God when boom chicka bow, a flash of light appears caused by boo booms dropped from the Amazon ships. And when the dust settles, Jeremy has become become the giant anthropomorphized cricket. Honestly, 
kind of terrifying. He looks like the prawns from District 9. Has anyone seen that movie? Anyways, as the newly dubbed Canterbury Cricket, Jeremy had become a patriotic hero, fighting for England until his last cricket chirp. Truly the best representation of the nation. America gets Uncle Sam, England gets a cricket. Number 5. Flex Mentalo. I mentioned the Doom Patrol in the last video, but we didn't actually talk about any of their members. We honestly should. One member who I think deserves to make it onto this list is Flex Mentalo. Flex here has the mysterious and hilarious power of muscle mystery, which allows him to alter reality by flexing different muscles. For example, flexing his scalinus minimus, Flex has the ability to survive in the vacuum of space for an extended amount of time. His other powers include enhanced senses, mind control, precognition, reality alteration, superhuman durability, superhuman strength, and telepathy. He is a close friend of Danny the Street, who was also in the last video, and his reviews on Google note him to be sweet and helpful. He first appeared in Doom Patrol in Volume 2, number 35 in 1990, and I think my favorite piece of art is the one with the title of Hero of the Beach, with someone in the background going, it's Flex Mentallo. Number 4, Dog Welder. Now look. Weird isn't always pleasant. Unfortunately, for all of us, Dog Welder is about as bad as he sounds. He's a crime fighter, yes, a do-gooder, who haunts and maims evildoers by welding no longer living dogs to them. Dog Welder is a mysterious and demented member of Section 8, a superhero team, and he first appears in Hitman number 18. He keeps his face hidden behind a welding mask, and we never learn his true identity, but he seems to live in an alleyway that he sets traps for animals in. He also seems to have an endless supply of dogs of the afterlife to stick to people's faces. Even though he is apparently a hero, I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief knowing he met his demise in Section 8's final battle, and we don't need to see him again, ever. Alright, let's move on. Number 3, Matter Eater Lad. When an alien race has all their food infected by microbes, instead of going extinct, as you might expect, they evolve to be able to eat unlimited amounts of any form of matter to survive instead. Yes, welcome to Planet Pepto Bismol. Oh, sorry, no, just Bismol. Home to Legion of Superheroes member Tenzil Kem, better known as Matter Eater Lad. The 15th member to join the Legion, Matter Eater has an ability you just wouldn't think would be useful. But if you get stuck inside somewhere, I can guarantee you want this guy on your team. He can eat through literally anything due to digestive enzymes. Thanks to, well, Thanks to how comic books just are, this ability has become more and more useful and in very random ways. For example, Bismolians don't possess any other superpowers really, but the ability to eat tons and tons of anything and digest it in literally seconds apparently translates into food energy that can give them, oh I don't know, super speed for example. Or like when he ate through a whole asteroid in minutes. I just don't want to imagine how his bathroom breaks go. No thanks. Number two, Liesl Pawn. The Green Lantern Corps, actually every Lantern Corps really, has members of all different shapes and sizes. But what utterly baffles me personally is knowing the Green Lanterns have a super intelligent, justice seeking smallpox virus on their roster. Assigned to Section 119, Liesl wasn't really able to join the other Lanterns in team meetings on the Green Lantern world. For the same reason your boss asks you to stay home if you've got a cold. The Green Lanterns aren't trying to get sick. Really. Liesl Pond's partner in Sector 119 was Remus. Was because Remus was a fatal victim of Despotelis, who is also a sentient virus, but part of the Yellow Lantern Corps, so evil. Despotelis infected Guy Gardner, and wanting revenge for the attack on her sector and the loss of Remus, Liesl Pond entered into Guy, and the two battled with Liesl Pond, defeating the virus and capturing Despotelis, who Liesl brought back to Oa for the Green Lantern Corps doctor, Ceranic Natu, to work on a vaccine for. Number 1, Red Bee. When I think of all the animals that would make good sidekicks or super pets, bees are not my first choice. Think about it. As soon as they sting you, that's it. You need another bee to replace that one. Well, ain't it just the fitting coincidence that the trained bees used by Red Bee are a species of bee that don't die when they sting people. Not wasps though. They're bees, okay? Not wasps. Richard Rowley, the first Red Bee, was a superhero during World War II that used a weapon that fired a sting shot. Yatch! And inside his utility belt, he carried a swarm of bees that he would use against villains. Again, Someone tell Nicolas Cage to watch out. He first appeared in Hit Comics number one in the 1940s. The second Red Bee would be his great niece, Jenna Rally. This Red Bee used two mechanical bees that fire electricity, a tech suit, and was mutated by alien insects to produce pheromones that she can use to control her bees. At least that makes more sense than training a colony of bees. 
right? Right? I don't know. Number 10, Gorgon. If you remember the weirdest DC Multiverse Superheroes video, which you should check out, I talked about a pastiche of the Incredible Hulk in DC Comics called Big Baby from Earth 8. He was part of a team called the Retaliators, who were supposed to be a joke version of the Avengers. This universe also had a team of villains called the Extremists. And on that team was a Dr. Octopus type character named Gorgon. While Gorgon did utilize technological enhancements, I think his octopus likeness comes in the form of his prehensile hair. The hair tentacles he uses and his role as a scientist mixed with his weight and oddly familiar glasses all come together to really evoke a Dr. Octopus likeness which is just weird enough to make me double take. He is also familiar enough that I can't really put him any higher on this list so there's that. Number 9. Dex Star or Dex Star or Dexter or Dex Star Dex Star -ra -ra. Cats can be ruthless, cold, and scary at times. I'll admit that. But while the Red Lantern of Sector 2814, Dex Star, is an irrationally rage-filled kitty, it's all because he loved his owner. Dex Star's origin shows the cat Dexter with his owner when she is attacked by robbers who broke into her home. While Dexter tried his best to scratch the attacker, he ended up ending the life of Dexter's owner. When the police showed up on the scene, Dexter was kicked out into the streets so as to not contaminate the scene. Now two rascals from the streets found Dexter when he was trying to sleep, put him in a sack, and threw him into a river. Now that is one hell of a sequence of events. And all this happening filled the poor little kitty with enough rage that it caught the attention of Atrocitus, who called out to him and made him a Red Lantern. With this newfound power of the Red Lantern ring, the rage kitty exacted his sweet revenge on the hoodlums and flew to say goodbye to his owner one last time, saying in his little cat language, I find who hurt you, I kill. I good kitty. I love this cat, but I also I also wouldn't dare mess with it ever. Number 8, Prometheus. Heroes and villains with no powers always seem to be some of the most powerful. It's strange. Take Prometheus. After seeing his criminal parents pass at the hands of police, he vows a vendetta on any form of justice. A vendetta that would push him to be able to defeat the whole Justice League single-handedly. He shot the Martian Manhunter with a dart that turned his power against him and set him on fire. He infected Steel's armor with a computer virus which commanded the suit to damage the watchtower. He hypnotized the Huntress into unconsciousness. He attacked Green Lantern with a neural chaff that rendered his ring useless. He trapped the angel Zariel in limbo. He tricked the Flash into believing that he had planted motion sensitive devices that would explode if the Flash used his powers. And he defeated Batman in hand to hand combat. That's probably the most nuts thing on this list. His origin is very similar to Batman's. After his parents were dispatched from the mortal plane, he would travel the globe training and becoming the ultimate combat machine. But he also attended the top universities learning as much as he could. He eventually sets up a base in the Ghost Zone. And from here, he built an armor that could download information on any opponent's fighting style, kind of reminiscent of Taskmaster's ability. He is kind of crazy capable, and his vendetta on any kind of justice plus his Batman likeness just makes him kind of a little strange to me. But also terrifying. Number 7, Earth 17 Superman. On Earth 17, superheroes are a product of government experiments. The Superman of this universe, Overman, was the first, with the other superheroes being spawns of his DNA. Now that may be weird, but that ain't the weird part. He also doesn't really seem like a villain yet, does he? Well, after contracting a disease, a disease, you know, contracting a disease from another person, yes, like that kind of disease, he goes insane and destroys the Justice League and reduces his world to rubble. He then gets his filthy paws on a doomsday boom boom that he intends to use on Earth 17 and wipe it out. The crisis on infinite Earths destroyed this reality just like DC tried to destroy such a naughty Superman story. Even having different iterations of Overmans who were different. Like, like an Overman who became allied with the Axis powers in World War II. But the internet never forgets DC Comics and people like me exist to remind everyone of the things you publish into this world. I am sorry, sort of. Thanks for the content. Number six, Mr. Mixelpidelic. Look, 
I talked about Batmite when discussing heroes, and he wasn't even really a hero. So how can I not mention the first fifth dimensional imp in this video? Plus he's got a fun name. Mr. Mixlepidilic is a reality warping imp obsessed with Superman, who just like his rival Batmite did with Batman, simply seeks to annoy the hell out of Superman and just prove he is smarter than him. Which is good, because he has a level of power that in other hands could cause the entire end of the multiverse. More on that later though. He can do almost anything imaginable if he wishes it. And his only weakness really is being convinced or tricked into saying his name backwards to send him back to the fifth dimension. Which if you're trying to say it correctly is honestly a superpower in and of itself. Click, click, clitopazixum, clitopazixum. Clitopazixum, I got it. Mixopidolic, clitopazixum. Number five, Emperor Joker. Mr. Mixopidolic has an extreme level of power, like I said. Also, like I said, if this power fell into the wrong hands, it could be potentially reality ending. Now, what hands could be worse than the psychotic hands of Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker? Well, that's exactly who gets the power in the Emperor Joker storyline. Mr. Mix gets bored and wants to give Joker 1% of his power just to see the tricks Joker is able to pull off, but instead, the Joker tricks Mr. Mixopidilic into giving him 99.9% .9 of his power instead. Joker uses this power to rewrite all of reality to become his sick, twisted dream world. He eats the whole population of China out of a Chinese food container box. He keeps everyone stuck in a time loop, including Batman, who he introduces to the afterlife over and over every day forever. Oh, and he also turned Flash into a slow-moving obese man. Superman, the Spectre and Mr. Mixopidilic being the only ones who can remember the former world try to do something about this all powerful Joker. But that's just the problem. He is all powerful. He destroys all of reality, but he can't bring himself to destroy Batman fully. And because of this, he loses control of his power, allowing the Spectre and Mr. Mix to steal it back and fix all of reality. But this story is its pretty nuts. Number four, Condiment King. When the villainous Condiment King came on the scene, it was literally on the scene, as he appeared in the animated Batman TV show from 1992. One of the best, honestly. Condiment King was Buddy Stantler, a comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker into becoming a villain who wields condiment squirters and viciously horrible puns. I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later. How I've relished this meeting. Come Batman, let's see if you can cut the mustard. Diabolical stuff like that. The puns get even worse in the comics with his real name becoming a pun on its own. Mitchell Mayo. He isn't taken seriously by anyone. His weapons don't actually project his condiments at a speed fast enough to do anyone harm, but they sure are inconvenient, leaving nasty stains in your superhero costume. On the other hand, he does potentially have the ability to be able to cause anaphylactic shock if he is battling someone with an allergy, right? Number three, Monsieur Mala and the brain. Monsieur Mala is described in his wiki as <clears throat> a militant, super intelligent French gorilla. The brain, on the other hand, is described as a genius French scientist and master criminal who exists as a disembodied brain. So, those two descriptions are interesting enough on their own, but when I tell you the French militant gorilla and the disembodied brain are an item together, I think that just elevates the whole thing to a different level. Together, they are the primary leaders of the Brotherhood of Evil, who were villains to both the Doom Patrol and the Teen Titans. They both appeared in Doom Patrol 86 in 1964. Now, Brain was once a scientist who experimented on the gorilla who would become Mala, which would increase Mala's intelligence. An accident injured Ernst, and Mala had to remove Ernst's brain and place it in a technological holding thingy-majig to keep him alive and be able to communicate. The two are almost always together, with Mala carrying around the brain. Hey, look, I don't judge. You find love where you find love, but as a concept for supervillains who lead a team of supervillains, you gotta admit, it's, it's pretty odd to say the least. Number two. Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Let me repeat that for all those in the back who may not have heard. Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. I don't really have a problem with two thirds of that. I just get really hung up on the vegetable part. Is that weird? Sven Larsen is the man who claims that title. And while it is a completely ridiculous one, it is actually pretty fitting. Sven fell victim to an experiment of his own making which allows him to transform into any animal, vegetable, or mineral, either partially or fully, although 
He very obviously likes to do a bit of all three at the same time, which is an odd choice, but hey, I just work here. Animal Vegetable Mineral Man first appeared in Doom Patrol 89 in August 1964, and he is an enemy to the team, which makes sense given their weirdness. But Animal Vegetable Mineral Man here has a vendetta against the Doom Patrol's leader, the Chief, who he believed once stole an invention of his. An invention that, funnily enough, is the only way of stopping Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. But he didn't even do that, so it, I don't know. Look, it gets weirder and weirder, but I gotta move on. Before I do though, Animal Vegetable Mineral Man. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to get out of my system one more time. <laughs> Number one, Mr. Mind. I think anyone who hasn't heard of this villain before would be forgiven. When you think of the most fearsome villains, specifically the villains of Captain Marvel, otherwise known as Shazam, you may not first think about the seven inch long sentient worm from Venus known as Mr. Mind. This diabolically evil mind controlling worm, after the events of Infinite Crisis, would cocoon himself and then emerge as a massive monstrosity capable of manipulating reality, consuming universes, and traveling through time and space. He was described as eating years and events from this universe's history, altering the earth with every flap of his wings. It took a combined effort from Booster Gold, Supernova, and Skeets to defeat Mr. Mind by trapping him inside Skeets' shell which was fortified by the Suspendium. Then, Booster Gold threw Skeets through time with the help of Supernova to the day he was first discovered on Earth by Dr. Savannah. And then he is trapped in a time loop forever. So they didn't even actually end up like ending him. They just trapped him. This all powerful mind controlling seven inch long worm. Number 10, the three jokers. At the bottom of our list is the three jokers story. This is because it isn't canon to the main DC universe, but the setup is. When Batman became the god of knowledge by sitting on the Mobius chair, he became able to find out the answer to any question he asked. One of the first things he wanted to know was the true identity of his arch enemy, the Joker. To his surprise, the chair in informed him that the Joker was actually three different men. This was never really explored in main continuity, but in the Black Label story, The Three Jokers, we learned that the reason the Joker acts so differently depending on the day is that Batman has been dealing with three different Jokers, known as the Clown, who was the Joker who killed Jason Todd, the Comedian, the Joker who shot and paralyzed Barbara Gordon, and the Criminal, who seems to be the Golden Age version of the character. The writer, Jeff Johns, stated that it was because it was so revolutionary, it would be out of canon with the option of bringing it into the main universe once fans inevitably loved it. Comparing his story to Alan Moore's The Killing Joke, which went through a similar process. Personally, I think it's best this stays in Elseworlds, as it just opens up too many questions about Batman's already kind of weird continuity. Number 9, Martian Manhunter. Put some respect on my boy's name! In the new 52 era, one of the biggest changes made to the Justice League was that Martian Manhunter was not a founding member of the team, a place that he held for years. Instead, his spot was taken by Cyborg, who was now created thanks to a mother box. This had a ripple effect of changing the important place Cyborg held in the Teen Titans, meaning it was erased completely. I personally liked the change a little bit. I always have felt that Cyborg has been a little underappreciated, so to make him a founding member felt like a huge step up for his character, who is one of my favorites. But at the same time, John is also one of my favorites. It's just that his status as a newly arrived alien from Mars made it make more sense that Cyborg, who has lived a relatively normal human life on Earth, should be the one of the original defenders of the planet. It may be a weak argument, and I know that many people weren't too happy with the changes to both the JLA and the Titans. Let me know your thoughts. Number eight, Hal Jordan, from hero to villain to host. Hal Jordan was one of the most beloved and respected members of the Green Lantern Corps. When his home, Coast City, was destroyed by super supervillains, he was consumed by grief. He tried to recreate his city and its inhabitants with his ring, but as this was against the ring rules, he was summoned by the guardians of the universe for judgment. He snapped and killed pretty much the entire Green Lantern Corps, taking their rings in hopes of becoming so powerful that he could restart the universe and save his city. He started calling himself Parallax and was now a villain. He eventually learned the error of his ways and sacrificed himself to save the day and died. DC eventually wanted to bring him back as Green Lantern, but realized 
realized that would be really hard with him having committed so much genocide since he was a hero. They retconned it so that he was actually being influenced by a yellow fear demon named Parallax who had taken over his mind. This allowed Hal to rejoin the Green Lanterns, be a member of the Justice League, and become the Lantern's golden boy again by absolving him of any responsibility for his actions. Number 7. The Justice Society One of the most hated retcons to come out of the New 52 was that DC made it so that the Justice Society of America, a well respected team that included popular characters from the golden age of comics, that was a huge part of DC's comic book history both in the actual continuity and real life, had just never existed. It's just such an odd choice as the legacy aspect of DC Comics that these characters served as the basis for was just completely wiped out. That legacy concept had done so well for DC prior to the past decade so it seemed like such a strange choice to make. DC made a few weird choices with regards to retcons created during the New 52. Some were loved, some were not, but to fans this one seemed just straight up rude. Just because Jay Garrick and Alan Scott are old news doesn't mean they aren't as important. Respect your elders DC, come on! Number 6. Tim Drake Robin no more? When the DC Universe rebooted into the New 52 continuity, DC Editorial wanted to make their heroes younger and changed the continuity so that the Justice League had only been operating for 5 years. If they had wanted to start the New 52 with Batman working solo or with Dick Grayson still being Robin, this probably would have worked. But DC wanted to have their cake and eat it too, wanting a younger Batman but still wanting to use characters like Nightwing and Jason Todd. In order to accommodate the new timeline, retcons to the various Robin's backstories had to be made. Dick and Jason got away relatively unscathed, but Tim Drake got the short end of the stick. Tim was originally introduced after Jason Todd had died at the hands of the Joker. Batman was acting recklessly and Tim deduced that Batman was Bruce Wayne. Believing that Batman needs a Robin to temper his aggression, he asked Dick to become Robin again but ended up getting the gig himself, being the main boy wonder from 1990 until 2009 when Damian Wayne became the new Robin and Tim Drake became Red Robin. In New 52 canon, he never quite figured out Batman's identity and was never Robin, having apparently always been Red Robin. Fans Fans hated this and his original origin was eventually put back into canon. Another consequence of the New 52 was that in order to explain how Batman had a 10 year old son, Damien was retconned to be a genetically engineered baby who had grown faster than normal. Number 5. Identity Identity Crisis was a really engaging mystery story that paid great close attention to comic book history but unfortunately it is another one of DC's strange retconning events that changed quite a few things that left readers completely flabbergasted. Whether it was the super unnecessary and inappropriate use of Dr. Light's attack on Sue Dibney, which itself was an example of the crappy way women were treated in comic book stories in order to motivate the male hero, aka fridging, or the Justice League approved mind wipes that seemed kind of evil in the grand scheme of things. Sure, wiping Dr. Light's mind and turning him into essentially an idiot for what he did maybe seemed darkly justified, but wiping Batman as well? It caused Bruce to create the Brother MK1 satellite which eventually became Brother I and created the Omax. Catwoman also suspected that her personality shift from villain to basically a hero might not have been her own choice. It caused the villain community to band together over the fear of being mind wiped, leading Lex Luthor to create the society, and it even caused the falling apart of the Justice League. Also, can DC stop calling every damn event a crisis? I am in crisis just trying to keep track of them all. Number 4. Jay Garrick Fictional or nah? When Barry Allen was introduced in 1956 as a reinvention of the Flash, they explained that in Barry's universe, the original Flash, Jay Garrick, and all of his adventures were the fictional exploits of a comic book superhero that Barry liked growing up. So when Barry got powers, he took on the identity to honor him, making the Flash a cosplayer. This was retconned in the iconic Flash of Two Worlds story from 1961's Flash number 123, where Barry accidentally was transported to Jay's world. He learned that Jay was an different universe and that the comics written by Gardner Fox were actually dreams that he had remembered and written down. As Barry explained, obviously when the writer was asleep his mind was turned in on Jay's vibratory earth. This was a weird way to incorporate Jay Garrick, but it also had long running effects on the larger DC universe as this is also the introduction of the DC multiverse. Number 3. Jason Todd 
Ah, yes, the over aggressive black sheep of the Bat family. The poster boy for toxic Batman fans everywhere, and the most lazily written Robin of the bunch. At least the first. When Jason Todd first showed up on the scene, after the Robin mantle was abandoned by Dick Grayson, it was downhill from the start. For starters, DC made his backstory almost identical to that of Dick himself. Jason was part of a circus that was attacked by Killer Croc, which resulted in the passing of his parents. And that is when Batman took him under his wing and trained him to be Robin. Ah! This time it's the Killer Croc's fault. Very original, DC. I see what you did there. Very nice, yes. So already this Robin seemed to be the target of Batman for being exactly like his beloved Dick Grayson. But Jason wasn't Grayson, obviously. In a retcon, he was made to be impulsive, reckless, and rageful, probably because his mentor wanted the old guy back. I'd be mad too. Now, his backstory was reworked to make him a tough street kid whose parents succumbed to a life of crime and substances, but that's not the weird retcon. After his passing at the hands of the Joker, and technically at the hands of the fans, and after his resurrection as the Red Hood, he revealed to his sidekick that the cause of his streak of white hair was the fact that Batman had made the young Robin dye his hair from red to black in order to make him look more like Dick and avoid anyone asking about this new Robin's identity. Sure, it makes some sense, but my god, Batman needs to learn how to be a better Bat Dad. Number 2. Punching Reality In one of DC Comics' first and largest moves, the publisher removed all of the parallel Earths that they they created during the Bronze, Silver, and Golden Age of Comics in the Crisis on Infinite Earths. This was controversial even at the time, as it was a huge move that was meant to streamline their continuity and bring everything into one Earth. Unfortunately, the whole move was pretty pointless because it didn't take DC long to go back on that idea and retcon it, but they did it in what was honestly an incredibly odd way. We're talking comic books here, so there is a large suspension of disbelief that needs to take place, but making Superboy Prime punch reality just seems on another level. Being from an alternate reality himself, he got so mad at the current state of affairs in the DC universe that he punched a hole in reality which created the multiverse again and started the incredibly complex history of DC continuity. which only recently was reverted so that literally everything is canon if you want it to be. We did a whole explained on the DC continuity, so if you want to check that out, we will add a link for you right somewhere over here. Number one, Hawkman's origin. Hawkman has one of the most notoriously difficult origins to keep track of in all of comics, so I will be giving you an abridged version of his history. In his original 1940 origin, he is Egyptian royalty who has been reincarnated throughout time as a variety of different heroes before eventually becoming the archaeologist Carter. Hall, spelled like this. Carter becomes Hawkman and fights crime. With me so far? When reintroduced in 1961, he is an alien cop from the planet Thanagar named Carter Hall, spelt like this. He comes to Earth and takes on the secret identity of an archaeologist named Carter Hall, with the original spelling. It makes sense when you think of him as a total reinvention of the original character. Where things start to get confusing is two years later when we learn that the two different versions are actually multiversal variants of each other, with the alien living on Earth 1 and the original archaeologist being on Earth 2. In 1986, the Crisis on Infinite Earths happens, and all of the worlds are combined into one. How to handle the continuity? Well. They changed it so that they were two different people who just happened to have similar sounding names and were both Hawkman at different points in history, with the original operating in the 40s and the alien operating in the 80s. In 1994, Zero Hour happens and all of the various Hawkmen become one guy, but it doesn't stick. In 2011, the New 52 retcons Hawkman so that he has always been a space cop from Thanagar. In 2017, Carter with a C is reintroduced, with it being explained that he he reincarnates because the knife he was killed with in Egypt was made of nth metal from a Thanagarian ship, kind of introducing elements of both of the origins. In 2018, we learn that the two versions have become one again, with the space cop being one of Carter with a C's reincarnations, retconning the character to be able to be reborn not just in different eras on Earth, but on other planets as well. So to sum it up briefly, reincarnated Pharaoh becomes space cop, becomes two different people. He's retconned to have only ever been a space cop and is retconned one last time to be a reincarnated pharaoh who in one of his lives was an alien space cop. Which when you say it like that makes perfect sense. By the way, most of this can also be applied to Hawkgirl. <laughs>